now, uh, 9, Exodus 9. We're really in some interesting stuff here. <coughs> 9 1. Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says Yahweh the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. <laughs> This is good. I like this. Why? What's the demand all the time? Let so, my people go. Yeah, he he never changes in his in, in his representation of himself to the Pharaoh. He just says, "If you want to know more, I'll let you know more until you know enough." But you are going to let them go. Uh, in 1450 B.C., Tutmosis the Third had been on the throne of Egypt for 37 years. He was not a young man, he was an old man, and by Egyptian standards he was quite old. He was still vigorous, oh yes, there were the abscessed teeth and the scoliosis that I mentioned before. He had tripled the size of the Egyptian empire. And he had tripled the size of the Egyptian empire personally. When the armies of Egypt went out to fight in Palestine, who was there? He was there at the head of those armies. He had personally tripled the size of the Egyptian empire. And of course, vastly added to its wealth and its influence. It was the empire of its age. In the New Kingdom, the 18th dynasty, it was the place and he was the king. Right? Mesopotamia had no answer to the New Kingdom Egypt. Now, as I said, he'd been on the throne for 37 years. And he was the absolute master of Egypt, both by political power and what else? By virtue of the fact that he was... All the gods rolled into one. All the forces of nature, which were worshipped separately, were rolled into this one man. So... See, that's funny because he was personally responsible for all the responses of nature that were going on. He was the incarnation of the various forms of these gods. So when things were running amok, whose responsibility was it? It was his personally. Do you think he took this personally? Oh yeah, he did. <laughs> he, he wasn't saying, oh, you just offended my religion, but I know you didn't mean to offend me personally. <laughs> no. He himself was the issue. Now remember, this was the man who had murdered Hatshepsut, his half-sister and wife and stepmother, who had been the Pharaoh's daughter. And so he and Moses, this tug of war, was also personal. Why? Because they were the two people who had vied for the throne. And I, it's something of a nightmare after 37 years and half, after having attained everything that an Egyptian emperor could be expected to attain. Having reached the pinnacle of religious and political power to have Moses reappear. <laughs> Wouldn't that give you a headache? <laughs> yes, right. How Why? Oh, I think he fully intended to. He absolutely intended to. Can't you tell that this was a contest that was going to end in death for one of them? Why did he kill him right away? Oh, because, see, I think that there's something about the psychology of this. Tutmosis III hadn't had a challenge in a long time that was a real challenge. And what did he intend to do? Beat use Moses as an example. Oh, as an example. He was, oh. Yeah. Moses walks in out of the desert and says, let my people go. <laughs> this was the, tell Moses enjoyed that. You could tell from his response. Oh, he was going to take him apart little by little. And what did God do? That's what God did, isn't it? I mean, he could have he could have destroyed him in one night. But what? As an example, just what Tutmosis did, would have done, 
as an example, he was going to take the thing apart piece by piece. All right. Is it possible too that Moses still had a following in Egypt? I'm sure he did. Yes. I'm sure he did. I'm sure that in 40 years you don't forget. In 40 years, especially somebody who's still alive, and uh, certainly he had his partisans. There wouldn't have been that many Egyptians who left if he didn't. And you have to feel too that a lot of people were very, very, very angry with Tutmosis at the end of this. Right? Because he was personally responsible for it. And that's what their theology said, and then his actions showed that what? He was personally responsible. Alright, so here we say, verse 2, For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, Behold, the hand of Yahweh will fall with a very severe plague, plague on your cattle that are in the field, the horses, the asses, the camels, the domesticated herds and flocks. Now it's important. This, this, this is important. Why? <coughs> what did they use horses for? The Egyptians were the breeders of the first fine horses. Why? Because in the Hyksos period, the second intermediate period, they had domesticated horses for military use. That was an Egyptian invention. The horse was an Egyptian invention. The destruction of the horses would have done what? Yeah. The asses. Yes. Also, chief animal of irrigation. Walk around and around patiently, pulling those jugs that pour the water into the canals. The camels. All the trade. Geographically, because of where Egypt was, there wasn't any way to bring things in that they needed without camels. They, yeah, they had to go. They had to go across the Sahara to get to all the other regions of North Africa, and they had to go across the Arabian Desert to get all of the stuff on the Arabian Peninsula that they needed. There was no way to survive and have the standard of living they had without a camel. John, isn't it strange that the sheep were there? Because I thought that they were an abomination. To oh, yeah. They just kept them sealed off where their slaves kept them, but did they not use the products? Yeah. yeah. But Yahweh yeah, will make a distinction between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt so that nothing shall die of all that belongs to the people of Israel. And Yahweh yeah, said at times, saying, Tomorrow Yahweh yeah, will do this thing in the land. On the morrow Yahweh yeah, did this thing. All the cattle of the Egyptians died, but of the cattle of the people of Israel, not one died. Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the cattle of the Israelites was dead. He checked it to see if it could possibly be true. The heart of Pharaoh was hard. Now, Reading aloud is not an effective teaching method, but I have to read this section here. What's the book, John? Moses of the Gods of Egypt by John Davis that I mentioned last week. Such a plague would have had grave economic consequences in the land of Egypt. Oxen were depended on for the heavy labor required in agriculture. Camels, asses, horses, largely for transportation and military use. Cattle not only provided milk, but were very much an integral part of the worship in the land of Egypt. The economic losses on this occasion must have affected Pharaoh greatly because he personally kept large numbers of cattle under his control. The religious implications of this plague are most interesting and instructive. A large number of bulls and cows were considered sacred in Egypt. In the central area of the delta, four of the eleven provinces chose as their emblems various types of bulls and cows. A necropolis of sacred bulls was discovered near Memphis, which was the capital of the of Lower Egypt. Remember, Lower Egypt is the north. Memphis is the capital. Thebes is the capital of Upper Egypt. Memphis is the capital there in the central delta. Necropolis of sacred bulls was discovered near Memphis, which place was known for its worship of both Ta as a sacred apis bull. The apis bull was considered the sacred animal of the god Ta. Therefore, the associated worship at this site with Memphis is readily understood. And probably this, where Pharaoh is at his house, is probably occurring in Memphis. There was at any one time only one sacred apis bull, 
As soon as it died, another was chosen to take its place, an event that attracted a great deal of attention in the area of Memphis. The sacred bull was supposed to have been recognized by 28 distinctive marks that identified him as the deity and indicated that he was the object of worship. The importance of the Avis bull is perhaps best illustrated by one of the more spectacular archaeological discoveries of the Memphis region. On November 13, 1856, Auguste Mariette, this was the French man who was in charge by the, put there by the commissioner when France was in charge of Egypt, remember the 19th century? Auguste Mariette worked in this region digging down to a shaft-like stairway to an underground avenue measuring initially 320 feet long. Later excavations indicated that the total length of the tunnel avenues reached to 1120 feet. Using only torchlights, Mariette and a few of his workmen discovered 64 large burial chambers arranged along an avenue. Near the center of each burial room was a huge red or black granite sarcophagus approximately 12 feet long, 9 feet high, and 6 feet wide. Do you get these colossal dimensions? This is a sarcophagus. Each weighing about 60 tons. In each of these, a sacred apis bowl had been buried. When Mariette moved through this area, it became apparent that the tombs had long ago been robbed, except for one chamber which had escaped the hands of treasure hunters. That one chamber had been sealed during the reign of Ramses II. G. Frederick Owen described the discovery as follows. There, in the mortar, was the imprint of the fingers of the mason who had set the last stone during the reign of Ramses II. And there, in the dust, were the footprints of those who had trod that floor more than 3,000 years before. There also were the votive offerings dedicated by visitors who had come and gone so many centuries ago, among them an inscribed tablet of Ramses' own son, the high priest of Apis, and one of the chief dignitaries of that time. It is little wonder that when the great explorer stood in this tomb and saw things as they remained inviolate for 31 centuries, he was overwhelmed by the sight and burst into tears. The sacred Apis bull, kept in the enclosures near the temple of Ta was fed on delicacies and given as many heifers as he wanted. Special bullfights were held in his honor. Another deity whose worship would have been affected by the impact of this plague was Hathor, the goddess of love, beauty, and joy, frequently represented as a cow. The worship of this deity was centered mainly in the city of, D of Dendera, although its popularity is witnessed by representations both in Upper and Lower Egypt. The goddess is often depicted as a cow suckling the king, giving him divine nourishment. In Upper Egypt, the goddess appears as a woman with the head of a cow. In another town, Hathor was a woman, but her head was adorned with two horns of a cow with a sun disc between them. Another deity associated with the effects of this plague would be Nevis, a sacred bull venerated at Heliopolis and associated with the sun god Ra. Okay. So, right there, in the Delta region around the capital, this plague was striking directly at the chief gods of the region. Okay. Yeah, he always said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of ashes from the kiln and let Moses throw them toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh and it shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took ashes from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw them toward heaven. It became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and all the Egyptians. But Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. Now, as I mentioned last time, how were the Egyptians in medicine? Well, Western medicine really derives from Egypt, right? Many of the very medicines we use today were first concocted by the Egyptians. And I, I said, as we were ending last time, the idea of drugs, that is, of distilling medicines into a powerful drug, was an Egyptian idea. Their weakness was that a lot of them they couldn't inject, and had they known how to inject them because... Some things are poisonous if you take them by mouth, but if you can inject them, 
However, they did cut open the veins and pour powdered things into the veins, so they did the best thing they could to inject things into the bloodstream. They knew about putting things under the tongue, under the eyelids, and up the anal canal. They know how to cut open a, a skull and search for a brain tumor. Right? There were people who lived after that. Um, they even had a pretty good idea what several of the organs of the body did. Now you know they worshipped the organs of the body and they took them out and they would mummify them individually and put them in separate uh, bottles. Look, if a liver does a certain thing and it's part of the forces of nature and you can't live without it, then what would be logical to do? Get a liver god and worship it. Well, you can't worship a liver god without having the liver to represent the god, so... It's all perfectly logical and you're laughing. <laughs> Just remember that laughing would have killed you back a few centuries ago. <laughs> did, uh, did Pharaoh escape from uh, these plagues? I think so. None of the plagues fell on Pharaoh. Well, of course, of course, the flies were buzzing around his house, and uh, well, when, it, when it was dark, it was dark for him too. But he's not physically, personally in danger. Why? No, because God wants him to make the decisions and. He's the chief representation of the whole religion. The whole religion is wrapped up in him. So God wasn't interested in driving him mad. God was interested in letting him see the results and make decisions. Sekhmet, the lion goddess, was supposed to have the power of both creating epidemics and bringing those epidemics to an end. One of the great and most powerful priesthoods of ancient Egypt was the Sunno priesthood, which was the priesthood of Sekhmet, and they were the doctors. Okay. Amulets and other objects were employed by the Egyptians to ward off the danger of epidemics in their lives. And, of course, uh, the very fact that the magicians continued to be called, even after their impotence had been demonstrated, indicated something of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. The impact of the magicians is not to be underestimated. They were a potent force in the royal court, and so impressive was their presence that their names have been retained in the tradition. This occasion, like previous ones, did not bring a noticeable change in the attitude of the pharaoh, for the simple reason given in the text that the Lord hardened his heart. This was a sovereign and judicial act of God, but was not an isolated event. Uh, he here quotes the... Lord causing Absalom to reject the good counsel of Ahithophel, 2 Samuel 17, 14. Remember that one? Okay. He uh, also points out that it says uh, in uh, 1 Kings 12, 15, that it was uh, God who uh, led Rehoboam to reject the petitions of the elders of Israel. Uh, it says that it was the Lord who hardened the heart of Sion in Deuteronomy 2.30. And it says in Joshua 11.20 that the Canaanites' hearts were hardened by God so that they didn't uh, repent when they saw Israel coming in. This plague, like the previous ones, most assuredly had theological implications for the Egyptians. It did not bring death, but it was serious and painful <laughs> and caused people to seek relief from the Egyptian deities charged with the responsibilities of healing. Serapis was the chief of these deities. Now you, you remember the Serapis. One is reminded of Imhotep, the god of medicine and the guardian of the healing arts. The inability of these gods to act on behalf of the Egyptians surely must have led to deep despair and frustration. Now the magicians, the priests and the princes and commoners were all equally affected by the pain of a judgment that they could not ward off except by the decision of the Pharaoh. Okay. Now the next one. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says Yahweh the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on your heart and on your servants and your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. 
For by now I could have put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. And this is, you see, in the context of the epidemic. But for this purpose have I let you live to show you my power so that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as has never been in Egypt from the day it was founded till now. Now therefore send, get your cattle and all that you have in the field into safe shelter, for the hail that shall come down on every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home, they shall die. Then he who feared the word of Yahweh among the servants of Pharaoh made his slaves and his cattle flee into the houses. He who didn't regard the word of Yahweh left his slaves and his cattle in the field. What effect do you think it had on the Pharaoh to see his own people taking the warning seriously? Uh, what's, what's being indicated here? What's happening to the Pharaoh vis-a-vis -vis his control? Losing it. Yeah, <coughs> gradually losing it. Now he said to Moses, stretch forth your hand toward heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. Yahweh sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. Yahweh rained hail on the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such as there had never been in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Both man and beast, the hail struck down every plant in the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, there was no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. Yahweh is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. What do you think about that? What do you think about that statement? It's Pharaoh. Joseph is starting to wrecking the pulse, right? Yeah. Is Pharaoh starting to repent? No, he's not repenting. No, he's not repenting. We can't use that word in relation to him. He's definitely not repenting, and this shows that he isn't. I think he's scared. Oh. We extend this time, he says. Yeah. Well, that shows how shallow it was. We sinned this time. What does that mean? You didn't sin the other ten times? No, that's shallow. This isn't, this isn't repentance, this is what? This is the mission that I'm in serious trouble here. What can I do to get out of it without repenting? That's his question. Yeah, how far can I get you to cooperate with me and get me out of this without my having to change anything? That's the question. We've sinned this time. Furthermore, um, yeah, this comes from long years of being a negotiator, being a king. I and my people are in the wrong. No, 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 that's a lie. The theology of Egypt didn't allow the Pharaoh to say, I and my people. That's a lie. Who is, who is in total control of making the decisions? The Pharaoh, I and my people, why is he dragging them in? Yes, they're being killed because of him, but that's their theology, that's what they're stuck with. They have to reject that now to stay alive. It's deluding Oh, yes, this is negotiation. He's trying to get as little admission as he can make and still get out of it. Uh, Entreat Yahweh, for there's been enough of this thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I've gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to Yahweh. The thunder will cease, and there'll be no more hail that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. So, yes, it's very important. Moses, Moses is acting on behalf of God here. Right? He's the God figure. And what? He's also making decisions. And uh, he doesn't want the Pharaoh to think what? That I'm in the least bit yes, taken in by your statement. Uh, I'm going to entreat Yahweh for you anyway, but don't think it's because of that I believe what you said. Yeah, 
know, the, I think when that, that hail struck, it must have been really devastating. I remember when we were in Germany, well, we had hailstones, and they were about as big as snowballs. And it was just unbelievable. The damage it did? Yeah, and you know, you, you, my mother had to come get us with a thick, heavy quilt because they could just, uh, people were really actually had big bumps on their heads just from that falling. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I've ever seen, and I, I couldn't believe it how large they were. So if they had huge hailstones, you can imagine what it did to their country. Well, what's worse about it is that the, the Nile Delta, where this was all happening, is green and has trees and so forth, but it only has two inches of rain a year. It's, the only, it's close to the water, and so some moisture comes in off the Mediterranean that gets two inches of rain a year. <clears throat> two inches of rain. Think about that. A couple of weeks ago, we had two inches of rain in one day. Two inches of rain a year. Now, so any kind of rain is a big deal. So you can imagine what this was. These were big stones. I mean, they were huge, but they were like main towns. Yes, and to have this happening with lightning, with this is obviously you know you you have this kind of storm associated with the weather front, the cold front and the warm front together. You don't have that in Egypt. Even when it rains, it doesn't rain like this. It's not this kind of rain. <coughs> so this was an event to be remembered. <coughs> now another thing is they didn't, unlike the Canaanites, they didn't have a god of storm. They didn't have a god of hail and. Lightning, why? They were worshiping the forces of nature. If you don't have that, you don't have it. <laughs> and they've got the forces of nature, and that's what it means that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. They're worshiping the various forces of nature and their various manifestations. But now, something the Egyptians had not conceived of was that there's something beyond fate. There's something beyond the laws of nature that runs nature and is fixed. Nature is a muck here, so nature isn't fixed at all. Can you imagine how insecure they must have felt when the fixity that was typical of Egypt for thousands of years was being challenged and there wasn't anything fixed? They must have felt like they were in some sort of incredible science fiction nightmare. Right? They didn't know what was going to happen next. No. And that's the one thing the Egyptians had that made them such a confident, enduring people. They knew what was going to happen next. What was going to happen next? What had happened in the past. Now you've got a God running amok who's in control of nature and who is free. Remember that the same word mock that meant freedom meant order in Egypt. <coughs> That's totally far to my idea of freedom. How are you free in Egypt? You're free to do what? You're to free to conform to what already is. Now you've got a God that really is free. This really you can see given the history of Egypt, would have unhinged their minds. This is, this is going through some incredible nightmare. Well, you know, you, you, you sort of feel sorry for them, but at the same time, how else would you destroy a religion like that? Along with this, John, were they realizing that there was something beyond the Pharaoh, or which was their God? Oh, yes, they have to. I'm saying, you're concentrating here a lot on the fear element, but were they saying, there's something beyond? Well, that's what the made the fear. Yeah. The thing that made them secure was the Pharaoh was the forces of nature, which were fixed. And now everything is unfixed. Constantly this change, and it's sinking in. And these plagues were over a matter of months. They didn't all happen in three weeks. This is over a matter of months. But we have a plague here that's going on in January, the end of January and the beginning of February. And we have the Passover, which is in the end of March. Okay, So we've got a month between plagues. Why is God taking so long and letting it develop so slowly? Well, he could have done this in 10 weeks, but that isn't any time to make a rational decision when your mind is being unhinged and everything that you've ever known about reality is being taken apart. Well, right? too, if they worship the forces of nature, then you have to kind of work through a full cycle yes. of all the things that they were in awe of as they, um, as they came. 
Yes, and so they this thing moves from the fall equinox to the spring equinox. It goes through six months to let all the things that normally happen in Egypt, as you said, in the cycle of nature happen. Because how can you unmake the cycle of nature unless you let the cycle of nature go through? So this wasn't uh, this is a this is a six month sequence here. And I suppose that when one plague went away and there was some time that the Pharaoh probably deluded himself into thinking we've oh, gotten past that. Mm. Going back to the verse, and this is just a picky thing, mm. back to verse 6. Yeah. Obviously all the cattle weren't killed by the rain. No. I mean, this is a... I was picking up on that too. This is just a... I don't want to say an exaggeration, but it's a typical hyperbole. It may not even have been that. They had steady sources of replenishment. <coughs> I'm not saying that all the cattle were destroyed, but even if they had been, you could have had cattle in Egypt the next month. Yeah. We even have records of cattle being shipped from Byblos to Egypt on a steady basis, being, uh, being bred in Syria and being shipped to Egypt. So you could have all the Egyptian cattle killed one month and have them have cattle the next month. I know that the cattle were about gone at the end of the sequence. I know that they were about down to zero. Why? Because in the last, in his final compromise, Pharaoh said what? Go ahead and go. All the people leave. Just all of you leave, but what? Leave your, leave your cattle here. Well, that was the reason. They were out. The flax and the spelt were ruined. The barley was in the ear, and the flax was in the bud. The wheat and the spelt were not, or wheat and spelt were not ruined, for they were coming up. <coughs> okay, so end of January, beginning of February. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to Yahweh, and the thunder and the hail ceased. The rain no longer was on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart. He and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people of Israel go as Yahweh had spoken through Moses. Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son how I made sport of the Egyptians and what signs I've done among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. Now it's an extension here. First it was signs to whom? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Egyptians. Then to the Egyptians. And oddly enough, last of all, to Israel. It's time for Israel to get into the act of God's power. Um, the idea being that the Israelites already knew that God was powerful, but what are they finding out? He's even more powerful than they had been told in their own traditions. Yeah. So Moses went into Pharaoh. This is the first time where Pharaoh's heart is hardened in behalf of Israel. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh the God of Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Now this time it's introduced with a question. And it's, it's attack on the Pharaoh's pride. Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I'll bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land, and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. They shall eat every tree of yours which grows in the field, and fill your houses, and the houses of all your servants, and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen, from the day that they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Now this is interesting. This is not the normal pattern. What's going on here? Normally there's a little interchange, some compromise, who will do what, how, how long, when. To Pharaoh. Moses left to make an impression, waiting for the Pharaoh to come back. And Pharaoh's servant said to him, now they can't say this to him. Officially they cannot say this to him. All wisdom resides in the Pharaoh. They can't say this to him, but they do. Telling you what? 
their minds have changed. How long shall this man be a snare to us? What was the question that Moses asked? How long will you refuse to humble yourself? And their question echoes Moses' question. How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve Yahweh their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Oh. You can't speak to the Pharaoh, especially to Moses the third. Why? What would he do? Say that to him once. <laughs> you never make it to the underworld. You separate your head from your body and burn it up. Then you don't get to live on. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, which is what Moses had intended. Do you see the little coyness? Now, why did he leave them to think it over on this one and expect that they would bring him back? Because a locust plague, what? That's really scary. Because after the hail and thunder's over, you can start to rebuild and wait for the next crop, but what? Once the locusts have come, what do you have left? Nothing. 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 Have you ever seen locusts? I have. Yes. Go to the Midwest and see what they do to the uh, They really do leave nothing. I mean, there really is nothing left. Now, of course, Egypt had all through the Delta local locust gods. <laughs> of course. Uh, he describes here a locust plague in Central Africa. 1926 and 27 it started. Swarms of migratory African locusts in an area 50 by 120 miles on the plains of the River Niger near Timbuktu. The next year the swarms invaded Senegal and Sierra Leone. By 1930, now this is four years later, the whole of West Africa was covered by this pestilence with everything movable. The locusts continued to swarm and reached Khartoum now you know where that is in the Sudan, all the way across the continent, more than 2,000 miles to the east of Timbuktu. They then turned south, spreading across Ethiopia and Kenya into the Congo. In 1932, they reached Angola and finally South Africa. Before the plague finally spreaded out 14 years after it began, it affected 5 million square miles of Africa a land area double the size of the United States. A, lo a locust is capable of eating its own weight daily. One square mile will swarm, uh, of sw swarm normally contains between 100 and 200 million locusts. <laughs> it's unusual, however, for such plagues to occupy an area of a square mile. Swarms covering more than 400 square miles have been recorded and are not unusual. Flying locusts have been regarded as one of the marvels of nature. They're able to flap their wings nonstop for as much as 17 hours on record, may be able to fly at a cruising airspeed of 10 to 12 miles an hour for up to 20 hours. When young hoppers become winged adults, the bands become swarms with increased mobility, an average density of 130 million per square mile. Depending on wind conditions, collective movements ranges from a few miles to more than 60 miles a day. Even with modern technology, the locust is still a serious problem. Massive numbers of them still breed and move with devastation over much of Africa. Reports of such plagues uh, continue to appear, even in modern times. In 1963, uh, locusts destroyed every uh, bit of vegetation in an area of South Africa, 30,000 square miles, an area about the size of the state of Maine. And it talks about all the things that modern technology that the government of South Africa mobilized to try to stop the plague with absolutely no effect whatever. And then he goes on to say, well, considering what it has done in modern times, can you imagine what it meant to the Egyptians to face a plague with absolutely nothing to protect them? Mm -hmm. All right, so what happened?
Verse 8. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, Go serve Yahweh your God. But who are to go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters. We will go with our flocks and our herds. For we must hold a feast to Yahweh. And he said to them, Yahweh be with you if I ever let you or your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the adult men. Hashim among you and serve Yahweh for that is what you desire and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence Yahweh said to Moses stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land all that the hail has left so Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night and when it was morning, the east winds had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before nor ever shall be again. For they covered the face of the whole land. This is the ground. So the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. Not a green thing remained. Neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron in haste catch it said I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you well this is this is a lot better than the last time <laughs> right <laughs> now he's saying I now therefore forgive my sin I pray you that's only this once I won't do it again he says and entreat Yahweh your God only to remove this death from me so he went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahweh and Yahweh turned a very strong west wind which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the children of Israel go. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt and darkness to be felt. What do you notice about this one? This is an interesting pattern. What do you What? Oh yes. Yeah. Well, the Newt, the goddess of the sky, Ra, Amun Ra. Lots of gods and goddesses. The sun, the moon, the stars. Yes. But what I notice here is, who is not consulted? Yeah, there's no consultation here. There's no warning. For three of the plagues, there's no warning. It just happens. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did any rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they dwelt. Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go serve Yahweh. Your children also may go with you. Only let your flocks and herds remain behind. And I know why he said that. They didn't have anything left. Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Our cattle also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take of them to serve Yahweh our God. And we do not know with what we must serve Yahweh until we arrive there. So how about the negotiation this time? didn't work at all. Moses was much harsher this time. Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself and never see my face again. For in the day that you see my face you shall die. Moses said, As you say, I will not see your face again. Meaning what? Yeah. Now, of course, the narrative now for, for narrative purposes has been broken up. What actually happens here is that Moses has come with an annunciation of another plague and that is the beginning of the narrative about Passover. So for literary reasons, the structure breaks up the actual chronological order. That's a nice ending. Did, did, did you sense that that was the end? They all didn't live happily ever after the end, right? <laughs> and the next 11-1 opens a new literary unit something to be read on the special occasion of the Passover. 
However, chronologically it breaks up. Moses had more to tell him and he starts telling it to him in verse 4. He always said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward he will let you go hence. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they may ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewelry of silver and gold. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. He has an effect on what? In effect, Moses has done what? He has replaced the Pharaoh. And Moses said, thus says Yahweh, about midnight, now this is the, remember, chronologically is breaking up, but this is what he told the Pharaoh at this confrontation. About midnight, I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Now it doesn't say midnight tonight. And in fact, it wasn't midnight that night. Why did he just tell Pharaoh, in the middle of the night, I'm going to go forth? Yeah, because he had to sit and what? Sit and think. I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Now up to this point, he has been using the forces of nature against the Pharaoh. And it's been very noticeable that he chooses to use the force of nature rather than to do anything himself. But here, what? There's no force of nature, it's not a pestilence, nothing like that. What? I'm going to do something person and after I'm done doing it you'll let my people go every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the maidservant who is behind the mill and all the firstborn of the cattle and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt such as there's never been nor ever shall be again but against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, not a dog shall growl, that you may know that Yahweh makes a distinction between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down and say up to me, saying, Get you out, and all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. He hasn't made too much commentary on Moses personally, though we have seen that what is Moses' personal demeanor and tenor as this thing goes on. And it's interesting because God has brought him along to the point where, where, where it's not God whose patience is tried. What? Moses. It's Moses. A person in this position, Moses himself, is sick of the man and has lost patience with him. At the end of the chapter, uh, no, no, I've tried to cover that twice. Let me try it again. For literary reasons, 11.1 is the beginning of a new literary section that was to be read traditionally about the Passover. This is, a, this is the beginning of a new story, Once Upon a Time. And because they have broken it up this way, they have broken up the chronology. This story here where Moses is talking comes before or after the verses above. What? Before. before. We see this a lot. The, for, for, for structural reasons, for, uh, to bring an end at chapter 10 and a new beginning of chapter 11, they have reversed the sequence of these events. But of course, Westerners are much more interested in chronology than Easterners, right? The Eastern mind would not at all have been upset by the fact that we're going right on to a further conversation in a new literary section. It wasn't until these two stories were edited together by the priestly writer in the time of Hezekiah, and I know why it was in the time of Hezekiah, and I'll tell you that later. It wasn't until they were edited together by the priestly writer in the time of Hezekiah that an apparent contradiction occurs. Okay. Uh, now, getting back, uh, it's not a real contradiction. It's a pseudo contradiction. Um, so he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. 
Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. This is not the first time where we're going to see that God uses Moses as a foil in the Exodus. It's going to happen a number of times. It's already happened several times, but here's a good time to bring it up. God waits until Moses, a patient man, and, and unusually patient man, he's the foil. When an unusually patient man can't stand it anymore, then what? then God will act to show you that he himself as God is willing to go beyond human endurance with people before he will destroy them. All right. And on a number of occasions, God acts to calm Moses' anger down over a situation. And God is here saying to a very angry Moses, he's not going to listen to you, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. And now we have the long section on the institution of the Passover. We're going to interrupt here the uh, narrative for the purpose that this narrative was written which is about the religious institution of the Passover. Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you a beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb per household. If the household is too small, man his neighbor next shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. Take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head and its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains in the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. Your loins girded, sandals on your feet, Staff in hand, eat in, her, in a hurry. It is Yahweh's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the goods of Egypt, gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. So, see, this is not even subtle. It's on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall observe it as an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened from the first to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly. On the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. And you shall eat that night roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head and its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains in the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. Your loins girded, sandals on your feet, staff in hand, eat in, hur in a hurry. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And all the goods of Egypt, gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. So, see, this is not even subtle. It's on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall observe it as an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened from the first to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly. On the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts, your armies, 
That's what that word means. Out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an ordinance forever. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread and sow until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether sojourner or native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. Now this very wordy, detailed style is the style of the priestly code where the laws are given and they're compiled and explained further and yet further and further. This is typical of the priestly code. It's given great, precise des descriptions. Moses called the elders of Israel and said to them, Select lambs for yourselves according to your families. Kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin. Touch the lintel of the two doorposts with the blood. Now blood is life. And what is hyssop? Death. No, not at all. Hyssop. Yeah. The, oh, the bush. The herb. It's a medicine. That's right. Okay. Two symbols of life. All right. And none of you shall go out the, of his door of his house until the evening. For Yahweh passed through to slay the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lintel of the two door posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and, you, and not allow the destroyer to enter your house to slay you. You shall observe this right as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land which Yahweh will give you as he promised, you will keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Say, it is a sacrifice for Yahweh's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he slew the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. The people of Israel went and did so as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, Yahweh smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, not a little boy, not a little boy that Yul Brynner carried down the steps in the Ten Commandments. Tutmosis III was nearly 70. His oldest sons were about 60. This is the next Pharaoh who was killed. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house and there was not one dead. And he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go forth from among my people, both you and the people of Israel. Go and serve Yahweh as you said. Take your flocks and your herds as you said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, and they said, we're all dead men. Now, did they catch it? Had they caught it? If at that point the Pharaoh had said, no, you can't go, what would have happened? Yes, they caught it. What would have happened? They were all dead men. They caught it. They got it. Uh, and and, and that, the attitude toward death has changed here. Death is not a friend here either as was typical of Egypt. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their mantles on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked of the Egyptians jewelry of silver and gold and clothing, and Yahweh had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked, thus they despoiled the Egyptians. Okay. There's a problem here with so many dead, too, and that's that the issue is that they don't have the time that's necessary to embalm them all properly and prepare them for the underworld. There's too many dead. They were going to cease to exist. Yeah. And of course, if they all died, then that would be it. Besides which, the whole thing was called into question now. The nature of life and death, the nature of reality, it was all at sea. This is what caused the, the upheaval under Amenhotep IV and we, uh, changing his name to Akhenaten and Egyptian monotheism and only the Aten disc and an attempt to be a monotheistic religion uh, was an attempt to get this so destabilized Egypt that for two centuries it was unstable. John, would you think along with this that many of the Egyptians that were questioning Pharaoh's now godship, if I could use that who may not even really believe or be a believer in the God of Moses, still put blood over the doorpost to protect 
they would do it even though they may not believe. That's who the mixed multitude were, who left. And some of them, the mixed multitude gets a bad rap because uh, a lot of upheavals came from among them. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that a lot of those people became members of Israel and right. made it. They, right. they weren't all rebels. Some of them left Egypt and became members of Israel. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth about 600, 600 military units, not thousands, 600 military units on foot besides the women and children. An average of 50 divisions per tribe. Yeah, unfortunately this word, after the time of the monarchy, the word came to mean 1,000 because the army in the royal period, mimicking the Mesopotamian armies, came to have a thousand men in a division. But it wasn't so up until the time of David. Up to that time, it meant simply that they were organized into 600 local militias on the night that they left Egypt. I know that it wasn't 600,000 men. I know that for sure. <laughs> Why? Why do I know that? From Ramses to Sukkoth, uh, in about that 30 miles, you weren't squeezing in any 600,000 men plus women and children. Why? You see, if you allowed, uh, uh, if you put the people 10 wide and you allowed three feet between this guy and the man in front of him, what's the problem? The front of the column would already be leaving Israel out the north end heading into Mesopotamia before the southern end left Egypt. Yeah. No, no. There were not two million or two and a half million people. There were a sizable number, but it was in the order of what was there right between the two branches, the Pelusiac branch and the, and the Lake uh, Balaika branch of the uh, now Delta, about 30 miles wide. That was where Israel lived, and those were the people who left, and they were organized into 600 military units in that night. 600 militias, besides the women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very many cattle, both flocks and herds. They baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and couldn't tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any provisions. The time that the people of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of Yahweh, that's armies, this is army terminology, went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by Yahweh to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that same night is a night of watching kept to Yahweh by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. And this becomes an occasion for a, a law. Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you've circumcised him. No sojourner or hired servant may eat of it. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth any of the flesh outside the house. You shall not break a bone of it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to Yahweh, that all his males be circumcised, then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. There's always one law in civil law, but in religious law, you have to uh, follow the... Uh, commandments that make you headed toward conversion before you're allowed to keep the religious laws. Otherwise, you're automatic, automatically excluded. On that very day, Yahweh brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Yahweh said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of men and beasts, is mine. He's going to have some laws about that later about the firstborn. Moses said to the people, 
Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of Yahweh you were brought out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. This day you shall go forth in the month of Aviv, and when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. And you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand Yahweh has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. And when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to Yahweh all the first, all that first opens the womb. All the firstlings of cattle that are males shall be Yahweh's. Every first thing of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Why? What's the first? What's supposed to happen to the firstborn? It's Karen. It's supposed to be killed, right? <laughs> or you have to present an offering in their place. And when you, in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, by the strength of the hand of Yahweh, you brought us out of Egypt, from the house of bondage, for when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, Yahweh slew all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahweh all the males that opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or a frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand Yahweh brought you out of Egypt. Now, all of this has been uh, priestly material related to the law of the Passover. Have you noticed? <coughs> all been about the Passover, various facets of the Passover. Getting back to the narrative, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. The way of the land of the Philistines is a technical term. Way means road. It's just the Hebrew word for road. And it has that name in lots of Egyptian documents. The road of the land of Philistia. There's still a road there. They just paved over it. It's the same road. So many, it's only 70 miles. When you're in the Nile Delta, you don't have far to go to be in Israel. Only 70 miles of the Gaza Strip to get within the borders of biblical Israel. So they could have had a real short journey. And I'm sure that when they heard that they were leaving, what did they think? That's where they were going. Yep. They're going to go up the road along the ocean, with the ocean to our left. 70 miles, let's see. How many miles a day? Flocks now, herds, kids. 10 miles a day, that's what I think. I thought, I, I'm sure they thought in a week or two, but yeah. we'll be there, we'll have the land, and everything will be wonderful. But they went down the Wadi Tumalat. They turned, turned south and they went down the ravine. Now there had been an ancient river there, but the river was long since dried up. And they were going down this canyon toward the lakes, to, toward the Great Bitter Lake. Now the lake has been drained off because of the Suez Canal, but the outlines are still there. And the problem is that when you got to the end of the canyon there, the Egyptians had erected a series of forts to protect the <coughs> frontier from the roads coming in from the Sinai Peninsula. Now the Egyptians had control of the Sinai Peninsula. There were gold mines there, and copper mines, and uh, jewel mines. And they were working them, and they had slaves there. And some of those slaves lived and died in the mines. They never came up, never saw the sun. Lived their entire lives and died in the mines. Never even came up to see the air. That's a miserable thought, isn't it? In any case, uh, they were going down the canyon. And at the end of that canyon, there was a fort, big doll. means fort. Big doll isn't a place, it's a thing, it's a fort. So they got there and they couldn't pass the fort. 
Now you see when you can, you're in a canyon with a big fort at the end of it, you've got a problem. And on the other side of the fort there was this tidal basin. Now this tidal basin business is going to figure into the story. I'm going to try to tell you what happened without bringing Cecil B. DeMille in, in here and at the same time not having you so frustrated that it doesn't doesn't accord with what you thought happened that it outrages you. Let's try to take this slowly. <laughs> you have to have lived around tidal marshes to know how dangerous they are. In addition, the Egyptians were afraid of the water. Why? They didn't have big ships in the trade that they did have with Palestine. Their little ships kept the, the land in sight. Why were they afraid of the water? Because it might fall off the other side. Well, that's one reason. What's in the water? The, the sea monster. Seven-headed dragon. And all the gods of the land were, were somehow negated by once you got into the water, and they didn't know who to worship or how. The ocean, if you talk about the forces of nature, the ocean is unpredictable, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, there is always a problem when you get around tidal basins, especially tidal basins that are connected between freshwater and seawater. Right? And you know every year some fool is going to go to Maine and he's going to fish along one of the places where a river comes out to the ocean and what's going to happen? Yeah, he's going to be part of the evening news that night and now we'll forget him. We'll never think about him again. Because four more fools are going to have to have this happen next week. What's going to happen? They're going to drown because water is very treacherous. On one hand, you've got dry land. But what happens 30 minutes later? Suddenly you're in the middle of... Water. Not just water, but what? You've got this tide rushing in and what was... What was dry land 30 minutes ago is 10 feet deep now with a tide. Yeah. Bay of Fundy Lake. Yes. And what time of the year was this again? Spring. Yes. The spring equinox. The Passover moon. This was the Passover moon. The time of the highest tides. Okay. See, this all started in the fall and now it's spring. And in addition, the Egyptians, the Egyptian army was, was, was largely what? What were they following them with? Chariots. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> take, your, take your chariotry into the middle of a spring tidal basin when you're afraid. Of, the one thing you have to know about water is because I've had a few experiences, and I'm sure you have too, is if you're in trouble in the water, what's the most important thing? Don't panic. <laughs> Think about what you are, where you are, and what you have to do to stay alive. Because if you panic, what's going to happen? Yeah, you'll drown. And can you imagine these people in the middle of this situation panicking? What was going to happen? And of course, horses are notorious for sensing what people feel. Right? As soon as you panic around a horse, what's going to happen? The horse is going to panic too. It's a prescription for disaster. Okay? Now it's a tidal basin. It says the Sea of Reeds. That's what it means. It doesn't say the Red Sea here. Oh, I know it says Red Sea in Chronicles, but the Chronicler was, he was um, 800 years later. Uh, they went into the Sea of Reeds. It was a tidal basin. And no, it wasn't the Red Sea, no, the ocean didn't part, no, the walls weren't 160 feet high, but it sure was lethal mm -hmm. because of the nature of what it was. Now, let's see what it says here. Verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people round by way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Notice, notice what's the term here? What's the name here? What's the name here? How is the deity called here? Hmm? Yeah, this is Elohim. Yeah, this is God. 
Who have we been following here up to this point? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yes. So what we have here is an editorial comment uh, from the time of the Chronicler, which accords directly with the Chronicler, but is simply wrong. Let them be round by way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had solemnly sworn uh, the people of Israel, saying, God will visit you, then you must carry my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Yahweh said to Moses, then Yahweh said to Moses, picking up the earlier um, narrative, Right? We've been following the narrative about what Yahweh was saying to Moses in the plagues here. Yahweh said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hafiroth between Migdal, between the fortress and the sea, and in front of baal Zephon. You shall encamp over against it by the sea. All right. So he, he specifically told them to go into this trap. Okay. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him. He took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over them. And Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel as they went forth defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and encamped at the sea by Pihahiroth in front of Baal of the north, Baal Zaphon. So this was a military, these were probably mercenaries, probably, probably Canaanites. Uh, named the place Baal of the north, that was the name of their god, Baal Zaphon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were in great fear. Again, I would refer you to Dr. Shea's article in the review last summer, where the exact site is pinpoint. It was discovered in the late 70s. The exact site of, of Migdal and Pyrrhira, the, the very point at which they were facing the Reed Sea, is known today. You can walk right down the canyon and see the trap they were in. You actually can see pictures of the ridges on both sides, see uh, the situation they were in. The people of Israel cried out to Yahweh. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Let us alone to serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of Yahweh, which will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. Yahweh will fight for you, and you have only to be still. Great line. Yahweh will fight for you, and you have only to be still. Now, he wouldn't do it if they wouldn't be quiet. That was the condition. They had to stop screaming for help here. Uh, Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. <laughs> like God said to Moses, What's the problem here? Why are you even asking me what to do? Lift up your rod. He's sort of saying to Moses, you have a rod? What did you just do? You destroyed Egypt with this rod? You know what you're supposed to do? Don't be crying to me about it. He's placing Moses' responsibility to, to get them moving. Lift up your rod, stretch it out over the sea, and divide it, that the people of Israel may go on dry ground through the sea. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariotry, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who went before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. 
and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel and there was the cloud and the darkness and the night passed without one coming near the other all night then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea Yahweh drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land so that the waters were divided that tells me how deep it was <laughs> If it was 160 feet deep, boy, that would have been quite a quite a wind. Nobody would have gone across there because as soon as you took a step, it would have been flying up into the air. It's, <laughs> it's a tidal lake. That's what it was. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a barrier. Please, the word means barrier. Don't leave the word wall there because then what do you have to have if you read it as, as wall? Then you have to have... Do, do, yes, you've got to have these high... Down the top. Yes. What did you say this was? The word is barrier. Yeah, what, what was the before that? You mentioned something about that. That was a tidal what? A tidal basin. Okay, again the same basin. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the ground they were walking on that was dry was a sandy sandbar soon to be covered by water the people went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being a wall to them on the right and the left a barrier on the right and the left so the, it was parted by the wind but the tide was coming in the wind was blowing strong enough from the east to keep the tide from overflowing this thing that they were passing over but when the wind stopped what mm. Okay, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. In the morning watch, uh, Yahweh, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the hosts of the Egyptians and discomforted the hosts of the Egyptians, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, us, said let us flee from before Israel, for Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, and that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariotry and in the, on their horsemen. Now, on the morning watch here, the morning watch is when? When is this? Huh? No. No. Huh? Yes, it's yes, it's the the darkest hour before dawn. In the early evening, they sat there, nobody doing anything. But God actually sent Israel into the ocean in the middle of the night. And then, at the darkest hour before dawn, he removed the barrier and what? The, yeah, the Egyptians. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, tidal basins, unless they're in real areas like Pondy Bay, and have unusual tides, but normal tides run around four, four to six feet high. Uh, how do we relate that to, of course, their Cecil B. De Mills's the tide going over top of them, and, and you know, four feet, a um, um, man would not drown. You shouldn't, dr you shouldn't drown in a four-foot tide unless two things happen. You fell down here and were kept in there. Yeah, and of course, in four feet of water with the tide moving fast, what do you have to know how to do? very simple but you still have to be able to do it you have to at least know how to dog paddle and stay on top of the water right you have to remember that people have stayed, survived for days in the water right as long as what as long as they stayed on the top of it now if you belong to a culture that's afraid of the water anyway and this was impetuous on their part to go into this thing and uh, you, you've heard this, that you can drown in half a, water, half a cup of water if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and they're heavily laden, and the water was coming in on them, and what did they do? But John, the water is being held back by the wind. It wasn't being held back anymore. Wouldn't it come in in greater depth? That's I'm, all I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was swifter. I'm sure it was swifter. And suddenly they found themselves in the middle of an incoming tide, and clearly they panicked, and that's why we find their bodies later. And portions of this area, too, this is not a four-foot tidal basin, either. Portions of that area are much deeper than that. Yes. Well depends on 20 feet. It depends on where across the Great Bitter Lakes they went. 
Okay, exactly, exactly where? This was an extension of Radha. If this was an extension of the end of that arm of the Red Sea. Yeah, it's right where uh, fresh water and seawater meet in the tidal basin. And I know that it's the tide that got them. You know how I know that? It says so. Yes. Right? Verse 26. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back on the Egyptians, upon their chariots and on their horsemen. So Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its wanted flow when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it, and Yahweh routed the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them to the sea. Not so much as one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a barrier to them on the right and the left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. I know that it was an incoming tide that they drowned in. That's especially ironic. <laughs> It wasn't an outgoing tide sweeping them into the Red Sea. It was what? It was an incoming tide that deposited the bodies on the shore. Hmm? Do you, do you see? It does describe exactly what happened. Yeah. You'd wonder why those saw it wouldn't survive. No, no, no. I don't wonder. How many of them could swim? Uh, no, 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 you didn't listen to what I said. In a culture where if you step into that water, who's in control? <coughs> Leviathan is in control. You do not step into that water because you don't have a single God who can protect you. Why did the Pharaoh do it? Hmm? I'd like to know why after. He was so angry. Why did he tell them? He thought they were going to cross on dry land. He intended to catch him and kill him. He was so intent on killing him. The man had lost his good sense. All right? Now in control. And look, I don't think that he intended to get trapped in an incoming tide. The wind stopped suddenly, and suddenly they were in the middle of a tide. They didn't know that they were going in there to be getting trapped. They went in at 3 o'clock in the morning. They, they probably weren't even, even looking at where they were until it was too late. Yeah. Now, according to this, Pharaoh was destroyed with them, right? Mm hmm. And of course, Cecil B. Milton is not that you like to say that. Well, we have this. If this is Tutmosis the third, and I'm sure it is, we have his body. If we have his body, that means somebody went and recovered it. You know what? Share, share one stroke here. <laughs> <laughs> this is where this is where two plates are pulling apart, and it starts here and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. In fact, where the trade routes come down, you had to embark on ships to cross. This is some of the deepest coral reefs on the surface of the earth. Here, there's marine life here that isn't found anywhere else in the world. This goes all the way down the east coast of Africa, and it comes out in a rift where um, Victoria Falls is. That's where the rift ends. This is deep, major deep. I'm talking about thousands of feet deep. No wind blew it open, and even if it had blown it open, you know what? You couldn't cross it, 
because there are coral canyons thousands of feet deep. This is not, they did not cross the Meat Sea. They crossed the lanes here. And actually what they did was, they crossed like this, right into the Sinai Peninsula. They went down to Wadi Tumala, which is a, and here was the fort. Okay. Yes. Now then, we're going to find out if this is true by reading, reading the Song of Moses in chapter 15 also. Are you having fun? <laughs> I think we can stoop to so much of the traditional education we have. Yeah, well, we have religious tradition. Not just the Catholics. <laughs> we have one or two traditions of our own. Now then, let's see. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, saying, I will sing to... This is a very ancient song, and it has ancient Hebrew poetry. It's... it's uh, there are a few passages in the Old Testament where the poetry is really difficult. Even scholars spend long periods of time on Exodus 15 because this is really ancient. This is the song itself. This has been retained. This is the real song. Okay. Uh, I took a course in early Hebrew poetry at Harvard and we spent weeks on this. Very, very interesting. We're not going to go into the details. I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider. Well, not really. The horse and his chariotry or charioteer he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. See the couplets? Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his picked officers he sunk in the Reed Sea. The floods cover them. They went down in the depths like a stone. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of thy majesty thou overthrowest thy adversaries. Thou sendest forth thy fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of thy nostrils the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap and congealed in the hearts of the sea. This is coming out of God's nostrils now. What's the... This is poetry now. What's the east wind? It's the wind blowing out of his nostrils. nostrils. Yes. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like thee, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness? John, excuse me. Wouldn't that sound like it was deeper than four feet? No, not at all. Sank. They you sank. That's how they drowned. They sank. You could stand up in four feet of water. How do you tie when you're on sand? And maybe not then. And if it's coming in fast, you got to have good feet on those. <laughs> you know, i got to slip once with, with Remember Estelle at Overcoat. <laughs> I think what has happened, uh, we, so, we so want to be sure it's a miracle gone rather than not something of nature that we built up that wind pot in the water. Well, it says it here. It's just that we have to see what it is that it's saying. Um, who is like the Oyawi among the gods? Who is like the majestic in holiness? Terrible and glorious deeds, doing wonders. Thou didst stretch out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. And there, now look, we're reading poetry. Don't try to draw out of poetry. Don't literalize every poetic line. Okay? The earth didn't swallow them. Now, this is gulping. And the wind didn't come out of God's nose. Unless there was a big nose over the, over the sky there and there was wind coming out of it. Symbolic. Yes, that's right. That's what poetry is. So don't, so don't take one line out of it and make it literal and say, well, all right. Yes. Look, this is... And what if I told you about poetry operating in a, on multiple levels, right? Is this writing history? Is it writing symbolism? 
Is it writing theology? Well, it's writing all of those. After all, what does mm-hmm. Yamsuf mean? Uh, <coughs> what does Yamsuf mean anyway? See of reason. Yeah. Yeah. Except that suf and soap are the same word. Okay? The vocalization is the same word. This means read, and this means annihilation or destruction or obliteration. So where did the horse and his rider go? They sunk in the sea of reeds. Or they went into the sea of annihilation. And they never came out. And which does the poet mean? Both, of course. Obviously, that's what poetry is. For my unnatural portions, east to west, the, if they are going east, that means that the wind would be directly at them from That's right, the in their face, exactly. All right, you're in a canyon, and, and under normal circumstances, it would be at your back, coming down the canyon across the That's ocean. right. This so what you're saying to me is, uh, somewhere along the way, the Lord turned the wind around and blew it right back up the canyon. Just like we had with the uh, locusts. Okay. Right? It's blowing one way to get them, and the other way to get rid of them. All right. Uh, verse 13, now this is very interesting. Thou hast led in thy steadfast love the people whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them by thy strength to thy holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized on the inhabitants of Philistia. Now the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling seizes them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread falls upon them because of thy greatness, the greatness of thy arm. They are still as a stone till thy people, O Yahweh, pass by, till thy people pass whom thou hast purchased. Thou wilt bring them in and plant them on thine own mountain, the place, O Yahweh, which thou hast made for thy abode, the sanctuary, O Yahweh, which thy hands have established. Yahweh will reign forever and ever. Now, this does not mean the sanctuary in Jerusalem, of course. That's far in the future. This means the sacred mountain where they were headed. Mount Sinai, wherever that is, or whatever that is. Okay. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, Yahweh brought back the waters of the sea on them. The people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Mary the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Now we've got two traditions here. The superscription to the song, obviously not written at the time, 15.1, chapter 15.1, says who wrote the song? Yes. Moses. That's a superscription from later. Who wrote the song according to the prose narrative? Yes. Miriam wrote the song. Okay. Uh, did you catch it? Did you all catch it? The psalm, Exodus 15, is the song of Miriam. The superscription is wrong. Well, is there a song of Moses? I heard in Revelation about the song of Moses and the Lamb. Is there a song of Moses too? It might have referred to this, but I don't think so. I think it's referring to the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 for technical reasons. That's a different different thing because the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 is about triumph over sin and that's what the 144,000 is about this is talking about the destruction of an enemy that's something a little different this is the song of Miriam this is the song of Miriam you do see don't you that the verse 21 the first lines there are the first lines of the song all right 